on World News Tonight. Shelling continues. Deadly barrage from Russia keeps destroying Ukraine and President Zelensky makes an urgent request. Pending recession. The IMF and the World Bank warns the global community of a pending global recession in the next two years. Imperial coronation. King Charles III will be crowned along with Queen Consort Camilla in May 2023. And festive celebrations. North Korea celebrates 77 years of the country's workers' parties in a show of elaborate fireworks and celebrations. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. In the wake of Russia's widespread missile launches against Ukraine, which saw Russian forces showering Ukraine with yet more missiles and munition carrying drones, killing at least 19 people, the U.S. is speeding up shipments of specialized weaponry to show up Ukraine's aerial defenses as President Zelensky requested for more arms from the G7. For a second straight day, Russia escalated its war to conquer Ukraine with new missile strikes, including on this building in Zaporizhia. It came just hours before the emergency meeting of the G7, where Ukraine's President Zelensky had one main request, more air defenses. Zelensky saying if Ukraine gets them, Russian missile strikes will cease to work. It follows Russia's strikes on Monday hitting civilian areas with dozens of long-range cruise missiles and drones on a scale not seen since the initial invasion nearly a year ago. A college student was filming a video message in a park in Kyiv when first she heard the sound of incoming. Then a missile exploded nearby. In Lviv, a dash camera caught a Russian missile striking a power station, causing blackouts in parts of the city. Russia attacked at least 12 districts, according to Ukrainian officials, several for the first time in months. Moscow says its latest barrage is retaliation after this weekend's attack on the only bridge linking the Russian mainland to occupied Crimea. Russian media say Ukrainian intelligence detonated a truck bomb and damaged the bridge. Without directly claiming credit, Ukrainians are reveling in the attack issuing a stamp within hours of the blast, which soon became street art, celebrating President Putin's beloved bridge in flames. Thousands of people gathered at temples in Northeast Thailand to cremate the victims of a massacre of 36 people, amongst them 22 preschool children killed in a rampage by a disgrace policeman that shocked the world. The rescue efforts are still underway as many were forced to take shelter. Family members of the Thai massacre victims watched from a distance as the abbot of Rat Samaki Temple lit funeral pyres on Tuesday, one by one. Atop the caskets were pictures of those killed, some accompanied by stuffed toys. Our intention is to send the children and their teacher off to heaven. The teacher will take the lead, and the 18 children will follow her steps to heaven. According to our beliefs and the desires of their parents and everyone here to send them off. The ceremonial cremation laid to rest 18 children between the ages of two and five, as well as their teacher. While not the usual practice, the outdoor pyres were built to accommodate the large number of victims. They were newly built from bricks, a group effort from volunteers. 36 people were killed in last Thursday's attack, including 22 children. The three-hour massacre marked the worst in Thailand's recent history. The attacker, a former Bangkok police sergeant, ended the spree at home by turning the weapon on himself after killing his partner and child. The International Monetary Fund cut its global growth forecast for 2023 amid colliding pressures from the war in Ukraine, high energy and food prices, inflation and sharply high interest rates warning that conditions could worsen next year. More bad news for the global economy. In its latest World Economic Outlook, the IMF has lowered its global growth forecast for next year to 2.7%. 
The new forecast is 0.2 percentage points lower than the previous one in July. This is the fourth downward revision this year. The IMF's top economist laid out three major factors currently hindering growth. The global economy continues to face steep challenges shaped by three powerful forces. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, the cost of living crisis caused by persistent and broadening inflation pressures, and the slowdown in China. Emerging economies have been hit hard by rising commodity prices, particularly those affecting food and fuel supplies. What's worse is that the report warned of a global recession. The three largest economies, the United States, China, and the Euro area, will continue to stall. In short, the worst is yet to come, and for many people, 2023 will feel like a recession. Meanwhile, the IMF cut next year's growth estimate for South Korea to 2 percent from the previous forecast of 2.1 percent, citing growing downside risks for the global economy. As for inflation, the IMF raised its 2022 inflation outlook for Korea to 5.5 percent, up from its previous forecast of 4 percent made in April. And for next year, the IMF also raised South Korea's inflation forecast to 3.8 percent, up 1.3 percentage points from its April forecast. Now, just before the IMF released its reports on the global economy growth, the UN report warned that 54 countries with nearly half in Africa need immediate debt relief to avoid extreme poverty. The United Nations Development Program warned on Tuesday that a serious debt crisis is now taking hold in poorer parts of the world. In a report, the UNDP estimated that 54 countries, with nearly half in sub-Saharan Africa, need immediate debt relief to avoid even more extreme poverty and give them a chance of dealing with climate change. The countries account for more than half of the world's poorest people. A serious debt crisis is unfolding, the report said, and the likelihood of a worsening outlook is high. The warning comes as the International Monetary Fund and World Bank hold meetings in Washington this week. That's amid rising global recession worries and a crop of debt crises in countries ranging from Sri Lanka and Pakistan to Chad, Ethiopia and Zambia. The UNDP's administrator, Achim Steiner, urged a string of measures. They include writing off debt and offering wider relief to a greater number of countries. The report also called for a recalibration of the G20-led common framework. It's the plan designed to help countries, pushed into financial trouble by the global health crisis, restructure their debt. Only Chad, Ethiopia and Zambia have used it so far. The UNDP's proposals include expanding the Common Framework's eligibility to include all heavily indebted countries and for any debt payments to be automatically suspended during the process. The Buckingham Palace announced Britain's King Charles III will be crowned at London's Westminster Abbey next May in a ceremony set to follow the traditional pageantry used for anointing monarchs over the last thousand years. Camilla, the Queen Consort, will be alongside the King and will also be crowned in the historic ceremony. The King had been attending an event in Scotland thanking locals in the town of Bolter for their work in the events following the death of Queen Elizabeth in September. The palace has not revealed specific details about the coronation, but some have wondered if the king intends to make it more inclusive while reflecting his vision of the future monarchy. Queen Elizabeth's coronation as queen on June 2, 1953, was the first to be televised and was regarded as a milestone in modernizing the monarchy, a move that her husband Prince Philip was said to have pushed from strongly. Let's go into a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, President Joe Biden said that there will be consequences for Saudi Arabia as the Riyadh-led OPEC Plus alliance moves to cut oil production and democratic lawyers call for a freeze on cooperation with the Saudis. They met in July with the U.S. President Joe Biden in a rapprochement with Riyadh and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. That relationship has now turned sour. Washington is angry at last week's decision by the Saudi-led OPEC cartel 
and its Russian-led allies, what's called OPEC+, Plus, to cut oil output by 2 million barrels per day in a bid to increase prices. The White House now says it will re-evaluate Saudi ties. In light of recent developments and, and OPEC Plus's uh, uh, decisions about oil production, that the president believes that we should review the bilateral relationship with Saudi Arabia and, uh, and, and to, take, uh, to take a look to see if that relationship um, is where it needs to be and, it, and that it is serving our national security interests. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that Saudi Arabia defied U.S. warnings. Riyadh dismissed American officials who said the output reduction would be perceived as siding with Russia in a new blow to relations. Vladimir Putin meeting UAE President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al Nayan for talks in St. Petersburg said OPEC Plus's actions were simply about creating market stability. I know your position. Our actions, our decisions, are not directed against anyone. We are not doing this to create problems for anyone. Our actions are aimed at creating stability in the global energy markets. The OPEC snub, aside being seen as a diplomatic slap in the face, raises fears of higher prices at the petrol pump. The production cut will begin next month with surging global energy prices already causing huge problems for governments and consumers worldwide. Hurricane Julia has mostly dissipated into the Gulf of Mexico after bringing torrential rain and mudslides that have left entire cities in Central America underwater. Tonight, the torrential rain continues after Hurricane Julia left the trail of destruction across Central America. Over the weekend, the Category 1 storm crashing into the coast of Nicaragua, then causing life-threatening flash floods and mudslides across the region. Families trapped in their homes, children clinging for their lives, rescued from the neck deep water and heavy currents. <laughs> Strong winds and raging currents have destroyed bridges and the death toll growing by the day. At least 28 people have been confirmed dead, including 14 in Guatemala and 9 in El Salvador. Among the casualties, five soldiers who died seeking refuge in a home where a wall collapsed on them. The country declaring a state of emergency with rivers and dams now overflowing. Over the weekend, entire neighborhoods underwater with communities joining forces and fighting the currents to make rescues, even creating a human chain formed in an attempt to save drivers trapped in the muddy flood waters. The storm affecting over 153,000 people across the region, leaving over 1,600 homeless, many forced to evacuate and some brought to shelters like this. Families have taken shelter under bridges and in elevated areas away from overflowing rivers. There, at least four have died, one woman getting swept away by the rapid currents, three others dying in their capsized boat. Now to a smashing success by NASA. New data shows that the mission to knock an asteroid off course went better than they had hoped. This is good news for the planet. From 7 million miles away, photographic proof that NASA's DART mission worked. That exploding cloud of dirt and rock, the moment the refrigerator-sized spacecraft slammed into an asteroid named Dimorphos, orbiting an even bigger asteroid. The impact gave Dimorphos a big shove, dramatically shortening its orbit even more than NASA had hoped. It was expected to be a huge success if it only slowed the orbit by about 10 minutes but it actually slowed it by 32 minutes. Traveling at 14,000 miles per hour, DART's nose camera caught the final seconds before impact. While the asteroid poses no risk to us, NASA is hoping it can one day use the same technique to divert a massive meteor on a collision course with Earth, a so-called planet killer like the one that killed off the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Warning time is really key here in order to enable this sort of asteroid deflection to potentially be used in the future. NASA says it's not not tracking any asteroid known to pose an imminent threat to Earth, but there may be others it doesn't see. Ideally, scientists would have decades of warning to use a similar deflection technique and save humanity. All of us have a responsibility to protect our home planet. After all, 
It's the only one we have. Over to some somber news, Angela Lansbury, who starred in the hit TV drama Murder, She Wrote, has died at the age of 96, just five days shy from her 97th birthday. Angela Lansbury has died at the age of 96, according to a statement from her family, which said she died peacefully in her sleep at home in Los Angeles. It's the best. The British-born actress, whose career spanned eight decades, played a wide range of characters, notably a crime-solving mystery writer in the long-running TV series Murder, She Wrote. Flowers were laid on her Hollywood Walk of Fame star. LA resident Mike Raziza went to pay his respects. Biggest icon she's ever touched my heart, and I've always watched her, her act and stuff. And I watched her. I mean, I learned from her. I watched her murder she wrote. You know, I watch all her shows, seasons that she's done. Lansbury was born in London in 1925 and went to the United States in 1940 to avoid the war with her mother, actress Moyna McGill, who appeared in several Hollywood films. Lansbury studied drama and her movie career got off to a quick start. Her movie debut as a teenager was playing the conniving Cockney maid in Gaslight in 1944. Nearly seven decades after this, in 2013, she was awarded an honorary Oscar for a lifetime achievement aged 88. Her other movie credits included National Velvet, The Dark at the Top of the Stairs, Bedknobs and Broomsticks and The Mirror Cracked. She also won five Tony Awards for Broadway performances. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Bank of Korea has raised its key interest rate by half a percent point. At 3%, now the benchmark rate is at the highest level in more than a decade. New York City Times Square is officially declared a gun-free zone. Mayor Eric Adams signed a bill that bans firearms from the iconic destination. Japanese yen depreciated for the first time since August 1998 in the latest of its monetary policies. This comes as a move to increase the economy growth in the Far East Island nation. Samsung Electronics has topped Forbes magazine's world's best employer list for the third straight year. The list was compiled based on anonymous surveys of the 150,000 staff at multinational companies in 57 countries. Memorials were held in Australia to mark 20 years since the deadly bomb blasted in Bali, Indonesia. A total of 202 people, including 88 Australians and 38 Indonesians, were killed in simultaneous explosions. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you with visuals of North Koreans taking part in a mass dance party in celebration of 77 years since the ruling Workers' Party of Korea was founded. Stay safe and have a good night.